je viens de prononcer donc I just, uh, uh, made my speech at the general assembly uh, uh, which is part of uh, several day visit yesterday we uh, started with a number of bilateral vi uh, meetings including with president trump and president rohani with the syrian opposition also there was a meeting this morning with President uh, Erdogan uh, and others, uh, an exchange of views with uh, NGOs um, based in New York, which made it possible for us to cover most of the crisis topics. This afternoon, we have uh, an important meeting on the climate uh, with the uh, number of ministers uh, regarding the world pact on the environment and also there was a meeting organized by the Secretary General and a leader's initiative. And also I will have bilateral meetings throughout the, these days of my visit. Also, I, I uh, spoke yesterday with President Kagame uh, to speak about the African Union. Also yesterday, together with the President's Concerned and the Secretary General, we had a meeting on the G5 Sahel, on the Sahel region. So a uh, very brief uh, summary of the uh, meetings I've held over these two days, but I suggest that we move immediately towards questions and answers. I'm ready to address all your questions and concerns. Mr. President, welcome to the United Nations on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association. My name is Sherman Bryce, Peace South African Broadcasting. Your friend, uh, President Donald Trump, uh, in his inaugural address to the, the UN General Assembly, he called the Iran deal one of the most one-sided transactions the United States had ever entered into. He called it an embarrassment for the United States. He also threatened to destroy North Korea if forced to defend itself or, or, or his allies or the United States allies. He referred to uh, Kim Jong-un as a rocket man and he made no mention of climate change in his entire speech. Given your closer relationship since your election with the President of the United States, if you believe that you and your approach is correct on these three issues, what would you tell your friend and how would you convince him that he was wrong? D'abord, permettez-moi. Well, first of all, um, these kinds of uh, topics allow me to uh, reserve my views and, and my uh, convictions. That's how the bilateral relationship is maintained and, and nurtured. Uh, the United Nations is one of our uh, essential allies, a historical partner a very important part in today and in the future. And it's in the framework of that relationship that as soon as I uh, uh, took office, I wanted to engage with President Trump. Uh, this made it possible for us to meet uh, during the NATO summit in, uh, uh, in Brussels, in Hamburg for the G20, in Paris for the 14th of July during his two-day visit. and. Again, yesterday during our bilateral meetings, this, in addition to the discussions we've had uh, over uh, by telephone, telephone discussions, we have views that are aligned on many topics of common interest: security, combating terrorism, with exemplary cooperation with the United, between the United States and France in the Sahel and Sahara region or the Middle East, in particular in the framework of the international coalition. This, for me, is essential. Then I think it's, it's not something that you've just uh, learned today. We do have disagreement on the climate. On this topic, you raised three of them. I uh, said in my speech that I think that to, to, to leave the climate agreement, which uh, President Trump has said that this is wish, but legally speaking, it needs to be implemented and it's, uh, it is not yet a reality. But I think this would be a mistake. Climate is an international challenge, and we need to combat climate change, uh, global warming, both for us and uh, by solidarity for the whole planet as a whole. The hurricanes that our two countries, by the way, have uh, been affected by, as in many other countries in the Caribbean, and today, this evening, is the end of uh, uh, Hurricane J J Jose. Jose it, it makes this issue even more urgent. Uh, Paris is a foundation. It is not an end in itself. It is a, a basis. And we took an engagement to, to uh, change our internal uh, uh, legislation standards and to provide additional funding. This is why I have uh, uh, 
uh, I'm organizing on the 12th December a summit uh, to take stock of the two years since signing the Paris Agreement and also to take stock specifically on the projects that are, have been implemented or that will be implemented because I think we need to focus on concrete projects as well as innovative funding. This is also why we want to launch the Global Pact for the Environment, which we will uh, present this afternoon with a number of other countries. This is one of the most important events uh, uh, during the General Assembly, which clearly demonstrates the strong commitment of several countries in order to establish new rights at the international level in the area of the environment. And finally, and this is a decision that we took domestically in France, uh, it's the climate plan that has been presented by uh, the uh, government, by the Minister of the Environment, to uh, take decisions domestically that makes it possible for us to consistent with this uh, commitment. And so on these topics, we continue to discuss with the United States. So we do still have disagreements, but we do hope that the United States will return uh, to join the international uh, consensus. To also, we, we need to have a clarification on how, uh, uh, legally speaking, uh, President Trump would put into, uh, into action his decision. And also, it's important to take, uh, uh, to bear, keep in mind the moral and economic uh, uh, realities uh, and, the, and, the, and the consequences uh, of such a move. Now, on North Korea, I expressed my position very clearly. I think we need to do everything possible, and we've uh, worked together with uh, President Trump on this, to increase the pressure on North Korea and to put an end to the provocations, but also to put an end to the, 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 the constant uh, uh, brinksmanship of this regime. And I think that sanctions uh, in particular are necessary, in particular effective sanctions. This requires a proactive policy, both by Russia and China, and this is what I called for. If we want to have sanctions that are effective economically, that could uh, force North Korea to change its positions, we need to strengthen these positions, uh, uh, these sanctions, and these two countries are key players. I said that I'm uh, against any military intervention because I'm looking at the map of the two Koreas, and I look at the geographical situation in which we are, in which we find ourselves, and any military intervention will lead to uh, the kind of material and human uh, destruction that uh, I believe must be absolutely avoided. Well, lastly, on Iran, and I, I expressed my position clearly uh, today. And yesterday, I, s I, I, I said this to President Trump, uh, I s I th whose position is to possibly denounce the 2015 agreement. Well, this is an agreement that France put, that the United States pushed for. France, uh, at one point, was against uh, it and did everything possible to improve it. I think that today it's the best possible agreement uh, available. It makes it possible for us to monitor the situation in Iran with regular inspections by the IAEA, which should lead to an improvement. Uh, President Trump considers that this is not a perfect agreement, uh, not sufficiently uh, protect uh, our interests. I can understand. But uh, I don't understand what the substitute uh, proposal is. And so in our meetings, I indicated that if there are some concerns about Iran, uh, uh, on his part, we need to work together. And uh, I said that we need to, to maintain the 2015 agreement uh, and ensure its full implementation. Obviously, if it's not fully implemented, then we should uh, consider sanctions uh, as provided for in the agreement. That is not uh, the situation today. If we simply throw out this agreement, it can't be replaced. Uh, it, there's nothing to replace it. And I don't want to find myself in a no man's land where we have a, a very major regional power that could, without any monitoring, without any kind of uh, 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 monitoring from the IAA could acquire nuclear uh, elements of nuclear weapons. So, um, so what I'm suggesting are not l legal aspects of the agreement, but additional elements, independent elements, which could cover some of the American concerns, but some of the concerns that have also been raised by countries in the region. First of all, to increase the constraints regarding uh, the uh, ballistic uh, uh, programs of uh, Iran. There's, the past few months, there have been several let's say, ballistic uh, programs in Iran that have led to uh, legitimate concerns. And I think that we need to take steps here with possibly, possibly sanctions, but that will be a second phase. And a third uh, focus, that is uh, the 
to, we need to start negotiations on the situation after 2025 because the 2015 agreement only covers 10 years until 2025. So we need to start discussions on the on what happens afterwards. So I'm more demanding, but to conclude, I just want to say that if we denounce the 2015 agreement, we can, let's say, we'll impose sanctions on Iran again. But will we resolve the issue of non-proliferation in Iran? I don't think so. I think it would be more dangerous for the region to abandon the 2015 agreement. Marc Semo, Le Monde. Marc Semo from Le Monde. Just to uh, follow along the philosophical line on multilateralism, despite everything, Sometimes war, unfortunately, can be a last resort. I'm thinking about North Korea in particular. You've uh, repeated that the situation is not favorable, but if everything remains as it is, if nothing moves forward, if Korea, North Korea continues to, uh, with its uh, uh, bombs, its testing, would some sort of military uh, intervention ultimately and unfortunately be the final resort? Multilateralism doesn't exclude uh, resorting to war. We have lived through and we are living through uh, the Syrian situation. It's a good example. Multilateralism provides a framework for military intervention, and then that should be within a diplomatic roadmap. I think multilateralism should do everything possible to avoid war. Every time we've forgotten that, lesson and we have sought a response that may seem more satisfactory in the short term, but without a diplomatic roadmap, we've been wrong. That's the case in Iraq and Libya. So as I see it, what should precede any military intervention should be a diplomatic roadmap within the framework of multilateralism. We're not there yet with North Korea, and that's why I believe today that it would be counterproductive to use that argument or to put it on the table as a possible immediate response. I say that because we are dealing with a regime whose uh, focus of action is not multilateralism, far from it, and it could lead to further ex escalation. And secondly, because given the geographic circumstances, military intervention would be extremely complex because we're speaking about a region that's extremely densely populated and with a close geographic links between North and South Korea. So I believe that the right answer today is to continue to put our collective pressure on this country through increased embargoes, which would involve China. And I welcome China's position on this. It would mean that China needs to put more pressure on North Korea and Russia needs to put more pressure on North Korea. Today, the North Korean economy depends heavily on those two powers. The European Union will carry out sanctions. We announced that at the European level a few weeks ago. But the direct impact on, the, on North Korea as a result of European uh, sanctions will not be sufficient. Uh, our act reaction is rather limited, and that's why it is uh, up to, North, uh, to Russia and to China to take our action in terms of multilateralism. But we shouldn't be putting forward a threat of response through war at this stage. Mr. President. You've said that seeking negotiations on Syria would be a priority in the Security Council. How are you going to overcome divisions within the Security Council? I'm coming back to the uh, Iranian policy as well as a second point. Do you share the views expressed by Mr. Trump on the Iranian policy in the region, in Syria and in Lebanon, uh, be outside of the uh, nuclear issues? Could you uh, qualify that further? Because a great deal has been said about the Iranian policy in the region. Uh, rather than speaking uh, in terms of general, uh, generalities, could you be more specific and then I can respond? Uh, Iranians' activities in Syria defending the uh, Syrian uh, regime and uh, uh, with Hezbollah as well in Lebanon. Well, firstly on Syria, what is the current situation? The Geneva process, which is the only political diplomatic uh, uh, 
uh, solution has been deadlocked. There is an Astana uh, process which is moving forward to provide for a military de-escalation in the conflict region. It's headed by three powers, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. So it's not been terribly successful for the Western world, uh, the United States or the United States. That's the present situation in which we find ourselves. The international coalition is now winning the war on terrorism in Syria, and we are fighting within that coalition we are hoping to put an end to, to terrorism. That, that is our goal. But our goal is not so much to, 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 uh, uh, to allow war to, to take root, but rather to ensure peace in Syria. So the goals are to preserve the current um, borders and the territorial status of Syria. It would not be positive to have a failed state in Syria. Secondly, we need to ensure political stability, and therefore we need to be inclusive in our political response. And that means that it can't not be Bashar al-Assad's regime in the long term, but there must be some sort of political transition where everyone can find his or her place. And thirdly, in the long term, in eradicating terrorism, we need to have the means to ensure long-term stability. Bashar al-Assad is a criminal. He should be tried and held accountable for his crimes uh, before uh, an international court. But I I'm, have not uh, taken that decision early on for pragmatic reasons. Since 2011, we have worked hard to resolve this issue, but with no results. So pragmatically speaking, we should move forward, follow the uh, political approach. And we have proposed setting up a contact group to revitalize the Geneva process and bring to the table all of the uh, forces in Syria, the opposition, as well as representatives from the regime, members of the P5, the European Union, and other stakeholders in the region, because this is the only way in which we can build on a sustainable and stable basis this political process that I referred to, because otherwise the Astana process will lead to a division of the country, and there's uh, incredible tension there uh, through influence in the region at present. So that is the position of France on Syria. It is moving forward. I've had discussions with a number of uh, sides. With the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, we had a meeting yesterday which uh, allowed for some progress, and the ministers in the P5 will meet to discuss this issue as well, and I hope that we will make some progress, and I think I can convince our partners of the need for this process. Otherwise, Syria will topple into instability and war. So our task in this area, in this region, is to attack terrorism. But it is also to build peace. And that involves diplomatic and political efforts. And I hope that we can carry out that mediation. Iran does have a role to play, or does play a role in the Syrian theater. And you referred to that uh, situation, influence on the Alawite regime. And there is a well-known will throughout the region to develop a, a, a Shiite influence. As an ambassador, I, I have said that the role of France is not to take sides for either side. For those who see things in black and white, I think our role is to build peace and to do everything possible to ensure that stability of the states can be preserved. So on Iran, I hope that it will be included in a process either within this process or through the United Nations or through the mediation efforts of France so that the country can be involved in a political process and that there not be any military response in Iran. I hope that the influence in Iraq would respect the Iraqi constitution and the work of the prime minister in terms of integrity, stability of the Iraqi state. And I hope in Lebanon, again, that a strong state will be supported and that we will work towards stability. Any effort to influence 
exert influence in the state should not disrupt stability in the countries where we're hoping to establish peace, because our priority should be the eradication of all forms of terrorism. Um, Farnas Vasihi from The Wall Street Journal, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you what action you plan to take at the Security Council uh, regarding Myanmar, Burma, and also what was your reaction, your personal reaction, when you heard President Trump say he wants to wipe Korea uh, off. Did you think that he used the UN as a platform to declare war on North Korea? On Korea and on North Korea, I think I, I gave the, the, the response that I consider appropriate. I think that neither uh, politics or diplomacy uh, has to do with the psychological comments. When it comes to that, I think it would be the end of po both uh, politics and diplomacy. I think we need to we need to focus on the specific subjects and as I said uh, the response to, to uh, the North Korean situation is a diplomatic and multilateral uh, response by increasing pressure using the means that I mentioned. Now as for Burma I also briefly mentioned the situation. It's a critical situation uh, in the uh, international arena. We know that today we're talking about uh, ethnic cleansing and it's unacceptable. And I call for two things. First of all, the the end of all the use of force, and secondly, the the end of this unacceptable ethnic cleansing, and uh, lastly, an essential uh, humanitarian access to allow civilians uh, to to help the civilians who are the victims of these atrocities. It's important for the United Nations to to deal with the situation. We owe it to our values. We owe it. To, and with the other members of the P5 uh, uh, who share this approach, we will take a concrete initiative in the next few days to uh, call uh, on uh, achieving what I just mentioned. Mr. President, thank you. Laurence Benamour from Agence France Presse. I'd like to come back to the question asked by my colleague regarding the method that you chose to uh, hold discussions with uh, President Trump. You have chosen to have close and friendly relations. And yet, for a long time, you were uh, very critical of him. In, in your statements, you said uh, that uh, unraveling the Iran agreement would not be uh, a responsible position. You uh, criticized uh, the uh, leaving the uh, Paris Agreement and the same thing on North Korea. Do you think your approach is uh, effective? Uh, that you have some influence. Aren't you uh, somewhat disappointed uh, regarding that he didn't mention the climate uh, agreement in his uh, in his statement uh, regarding also what he said about North Korea? I mean, aren't you disappointed? What what is your what is your conclusion? What are your conclusions regarding your approach to him? Well, first of all, uh, the very concrete consequences of our uh, decisions taken by President Trump on the ground together where we're working side by side. Those are important. I believe that uh, the the decisions taken by President Trump in combating terrorism, se ensuring security and stability in the uh, in Sahel region and the Middle East are the right decisions. Now, next, what President Trump uh, respect each other. I mean, he has his position, uh, but uh, we have we have disagreements. We uh, note our disagreements. Uh, I mean, just imagine uh, who would we be if uh, in our relations with the United States we renounce what we believe. So I think that we each have their own beliefs, each have our position. I think in the long run, and it's an effective approach, I think perhaps you should wait a little bit to see the results, and history will judge us on Iran and on North Korea and on climate, I I have a principle that I follow. I have I develop, I have built a French position together with my government and my team after extensive consultation. I speak to, I have spoken to everyone to try to move forward. I have said uh, bilaterally and very clearly and directly my position. I tried to convince my partner, and then of course uh, when I have to uh, make a statement, a public statement, I. I uh, uh, I, I make a certain, I, I express my position. What's important is not to express publicly what goes on in our bilateral meetings. So I will continue working this way, and I hope that it will achieve resu results in addition to the results on the ground that we've already achieved in our combat against terrorism. And I have great hope that on the three topics you mentioned, it will lead to positive results. Mr. President, uh, several speaking with the mic. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is Majid Ghali from Rudamia Network. It's very good to see you for the first time at the United Nations. I want to ask you about Iraq. Uh, this morning you met with President Erdogan, and now there is reportedly a Turkey, France, uh, and United Nations initiative 
diplomatic initiative to, uh, to prevent a referendum in Kurdistan region, northern of Iraq, for the independence. Uh, uh, French, uh, uh, I want to ask you what that initiative is. And France has been, France has been historically friendly to the Kurds. Uh, why France is being part of this diplomatic or international pressure to prevent a democratic process in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan? La France ne sera... France will never be part of an initiative which would prevent a diplomatic process, uh, rather a, a, a democratic process, correct, President. France has been involved in this historic process with the Kurds in particular and the Kurds in Iraq. This relationship is for the long term, and I have a great deal of respect for these people who have fought and defended their values and their history. President Mazani wanted to organize on the 24th of September a referendum, and the conclusions may well lead to complete independence uh, of a Kurdistan, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And if that referendum is held, then I would like it to be well uh, to have the proper representation of the Kurds in Iraq in the government and within the Iraqi constitution. I say that because today in Iraq, we need stability, territorial and political stability. And that is why I wanted the Iraqi prime minister not to be weakened. The uh, minister for foreign affairs, uh, went to Iraq a few weeks ago and was in Baghdad and uh, we and expressed the continuity of France's position. So I want to be quite clear on this. France is seeking stability in Iraq. It hopes to see the success of the Iraqi prime minister, but at the same time, it hopes a government will be set up and that there will be political balance which respects all minorities in particular the Kurds. And so I would invite uh, President Bazani to make that referendum, if it is retained, a referendum where people can uh, express the will to be fully uh, involved in the institutions of Iraq and not uh, do the reverse, which would have a very negative impact on the remainder of Iraq. Mr. Mr. President, I would like to follow up on the issue of uh, impunity. You discussed Sraghida Dargham of Al-Hayah. Uh, you said that uh, the, um, the matter of impunity is very uh, important to you, the, the stopping uh, the process of impunity. On the other hand, it's rather confusing message that you give on Syria. On one hand, you say that Bashar al-Assad is a war criminal. On the other hand, you say, well, you know, I have to be pragmatic and he's got to stay. And, uh, and uh, it's a very confusing message. Can you clarify yourself? And the second part of the question, another confusing message you're giving, if you permit me, Mr. President, is that you're insisting on Iran being part of the contact group that you are establishing uh, as a political process. You're bringing in Iran, whereas your partner, the United States, President Trump, was very clear on describing Iran's role in Syria. How do you practically, pragmatically, to use your word, mean to reconcile these two differences? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. I'll, I'll take one more question after this, uh, madam, and then I'll have to... Uh, and now, as far as Bashar al-Assad, I don't believe that my position is, position is paradoxical or, or, mixed, or a mixed message at all. What is the situation with Bashar al-Assad, for France at least? Since 2011, we've stated we are breaking all relations, and uh, the uh, precondition is for him to be removed. And that policy, for several years now, until a slight change that preceded my uh, uh, taking office, has not made it possible to, to, to make progress as much as uh, would have been uh, desirable in the framework. The coalition has not led to any results. In fact, we made some opponents on the ground to believe that we would go to the end of this approach without actually achieving the expected results. And I'll say very clearly, number one, my enemy in Syria, are Islamist terrorists, because they are the ones who attack the French people. It's not Bashar al-Assad. Two, Bashar al-Assad is a criminal. I've said this several times. It is first, he's first and foremost the enemy of the Syrian people. He will have to be held responsible, and I've said this constantly. Uh, he will have to face international justice. But 
thirdly, as I believe in stability, and in particular, the respect of people to, uh, the right of people to decide for themselves, it is not me in Paris who will say to the Syrian people who has to succeed uh, Bashar al-Assad or anyone else from the United Nations. So I believe that what we need to work on is not to remove uh, Bashar al-Assad, but rather to create a political situation that will make it possible for the Syrian people to freely, including those who had to uh, um, exile themselves from the region to vote peacefully and choose a f their future leaders. That is a much more responsible approach and a much more lasting one. Otherwise, if I follow the logic or the collective uh, tendency which could have led us in that direction, we, we, could have, uh, we could have repeated the same thing we did in the past in Iraq and uh, Libya. In Libya, everyone was, uh, was in favor of fighting uh, uh, against Gaddafi. Who did, who did we have to replace him? What happened afterwards? And what is the situation six uh, uh, years after? It's complete chaos. So uh, I said very clearly the duty of uh, France is, uh, first of all, it's security to fight against terrorism, but also to build in the long, for the long run, to build peace. And it's much more uh, complex than say that I just want to get rid of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad right away. It's not, it's not, it's not really uh, paradoxical or com complex at all. I said he's a criminal, too. He'll, he will have to face international justice. Second, I want to build the conditions uh, to, for other leaders to, to replace him, and those are my priorities. Now, on Iran, just to, to complete my answer, there again, I've said very clearly, I said very clearly earlier, if we don't, don't resolve the Syrian uh, conflict without having Iran at the table, we won't have an effective solution because Iran is one of the uh, parties that has an influence on Syria. Uh, we take note of the uh, American refusal, and I hope that the contact group will be set up and will move forward, and I hope that the United Nations and, and France can, can serve as an intermediary with Iran. Even if Iran is not at the table of the contact group, I uh, hope it can be regularly informed and included in this process with, ultimately, the wish that my wish that everyone join a common road map that is the role that France will seek to have. Last question. Yes, hello. One question. You were interviewed by the U.S. television, CNN. Why did you choose that media for uh, uh, not French uh, uh, news outlet? Let me uh, answer that very substantive question, because perhaps the French media are more interested in communication and not enough, uh, they aren't, aren't interested enough in content. Uh, but I have uh, spoken to the French media. When I see how much time has passed between, uh, uh, in the past four months to, uh, in, in comments on uh, what I say and what I don't say, I, it feels very narcissistic to me. Uh, here at the UN, a journalist uh, proposed uh, to hold an interview with me on my policies, and I agreed to that. I've given a number of interviews to French uh, journalists, to the Point, Figaro, others. Uh, they're journalists like yourselves, and I will continue to speak to the French press. But given the seriousness of all of the subjects that we've been discussing since the very beginning, I would say, Let's speak about the lives of our citizens. Let's speak about the challenges this planet is facing. But let us stop speaking in circles. Thank you.